Hey artists, how's it going? Can you guys hear us well? Hear me well. I hope we're live. I hope everything is, is cool here. Uh, let me know, Eben, if everything's okay there. I think it is. Hello. Yeah, let, let me know where you guys are from. Let us know. That'd be awesome to hear. Right. So, Poland, India, Canada. Cool to hear. Matt, we're like all over the world. There's so many artists everywhere. It's amazing. Awesome, guys. So we're not actually going to wait too long for, for the rest to follow here. So I'll just get started here. So um, hello, artists again, and uh, welcome to the Evident Design live stream. My name is Walid Figali. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Evident. I'm an artist and composer. And we're having this live event today because right now there's a challenge over at the Evident Design uh, group on this platform. So definitely challenge yourself there in composition. That's the whole uh, topic for today. Uh, and with us, with us today, we have a, a really awesome concept artist, illustrator and art tutor from uh, Mansfield, Connecticut in USA. You all know who it is. It's the one and only Tyler Edlin. Let me switch here to display here. So um, you can see here that Tyler paints these amazing environments. Let me just shut off the Slack thing. So you see he does these environments and characters, a uh, bunch of different commissions, fan art, uh, and a bunch more. He's worked with Disney, uh, Activision, Hitpoint Studios, and, and many other. I mean, if we just look at this, it's just so really nice, very sim simple, clear shapes, but still, still really beautiful. And also he has a bunch of tutorials, uh, like, you know, painting clouds and process shots and all of this, this stuff. Look at those chunky clouds. <laughs> I love that stuff. Um, he also has a, a YouTube channel here. So definitely follow him there uh, where he has a bunch of tutorials and stuff like that. And he also has a, um, a website called tyleredlinart.com and his own studios, brushsaucestudio.com. So you can check those out there as well. So let me go back here. Cool. So today we can uh, pick uh, Tyler's brain a bit <laughs> and uh, yeah, ask him anything you want. Uh, we'll be going through some insights into composition and art overall. So yeah, are you guys excited? It'll be fun to, to hang out here for a bit and talk some art. Awesome. Uh, we also have uh, my colleague Eben Schumacher. He's uh, here with us as well and he's also an artist. So yeah, that'll be fun. So let me switch through to the display. And boom. View, full screen. Tyler, how's it going, man? Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on on this wonderful Friday afternoon, at least in the States here. Yeah. <laughs> pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks. I'm a huge fan fan of your work. Welcome, man. I mean, I, I love your stuff too, man. It's really... Honestly, I watch them a lot and uh, I'm learning new things every, every day. Because even when you're a professional artist... You can still pick up a lot of stuff from from other people, right? So many things, so many things. Yeah, yeah. So how's um how's it going for you? You uh, it's you... going good. Yeah, all right. Yeah, overall, just very busy at you know, this time of year, and you know, balancing, learning a lot about being like a dad, a family guy, and and freelance and teaching, and it's it's a lot of little things that I'm I'm moving around constantly, <laughs> and you know, there's not a handbook for any of this. I I wish there was, but. A lot of you know learning through failures and mistakes and oversights and yeah, it's a lot of hands-on training i think that's the best way to to kind of get in and and learn and adapt right i think adaptability is a huge thing and to yeah. survive as as an artist as a freelancer and certainly as a parent these days my so, god my, i can't doing even a imagine lot of that, that. <laughs> I, I don't have kids but uh, i can only imagine how how your life changes when you have that you know one one of the best things i did do though was like i waited pretty pretty long i'm i'm you know kind of past the mid thirties at this point, but I can only imagine if I was really still trying to establish myself and went the family life, it would, it's, it's a lot. You gotta like have them super early, just get it done. Or right. I kind of like wait on the tail end like me, but yeah, it, it, it's pretty tough to, to kind of find time to uh, balance all of that. So, yeah. uh, but I'm working it and I'm enjoying it and, you know, doing this, the situation and stuff, of course I'm spending loads of time with them, which is, you know, something I always didn't have with my father. So it's, 
yeah, I'm just embracing it and making the best of every uh, situation that I possibly can. Right. Uh, that's awesome, man. Well, I think uh, what we would like to hear for to start here, I mean, just uh, tell us a bit about your background and how you got started with art and sort of tell us your journey, you know? Yeah, I I love I love art. I love I, well, that's, I guess, part of my thing is like I, I, I always had a hard time kind of like narrowing down my focus between a lot of my favorite things because I find that I that I enjoy so much of it and particularly way back i think it's like 2006 and 7 when i was in you know art college i i was finding that out really quickly like oh i like doing ink um ink drawings i love comic art i love i was taking sequential illustration classes i was doing i want to do poster art too and then i was i found out they you know make art for video games and i'm like oh i really like video games you know <laughs> so yeah i want i want i started getting my my attention started getting pulled everywhere so i i kind of always went heavy handed as a bit of a generalist, you know, I was taking what came along, you know, gradually improving, improving my skills. And, and that's one thing I would have, I guess, with, with a little bit more foresight, I would have probably focused on certain aspects a little more than others. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, and I guess a little bit of a jack of all trades in that, you know, doing, doing like character, character design work. I don't know how people find me and request me for character design, but it, but it happens still regularly. Like this week alone, someone wanted me 50 character designs. It's like, you see my art station. I have like 10, 50, 10, 10 characters. There's so many people that do characters so much better, you know, than me, but you know, it makes me well-rounded and it, I, you know, it, it defines who you are. So, but I like it. I, I, I definitely like, yeah. you know, like the environmental stuff. I like the fantasy scape. So when did you fun. start with all this stuff? Like when did you start to making making art have you always been painting and drawing or what's uh oh, what's your yeah, start and in in high school it was strictly just like fan art stuff just copying you know game art you know anything game art video game art you know i related like from all the old rpgs sell the stuff i just like draw the characters nothing more nothing no ever never had an intent to ever ever even surpass that i just mm. i had no idea um and then yeah i went i did uh, basically in high school i didn't do much at all i took right. some bare minimum high school art courses because it kept me out of the math and the science classes so i did do that but i mean it wasn't anything i was putting extra time in at home or like anything like that i was like average to the core i got like b's in art even in college i was taking college level art course. I, was, I was getting b's and stuff you know wow. i never kind of quite hit that uh, max threshold of the a's and becoming like the te teacher's fave that now that was never me uh, but, you know, I did enjoy it and certainly more than others, but I kind of just, yeah, in high school, I didn't do much at all. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of came back to it in college, starting at the very basics, you know, doing traditional mediums, you know, uh, charcoal, watercolor, um, acrylics and stuff and doing like the still lifes and a lot of observational work. And I think that's the one thing that a lot of students underestimate. Oh, I agree. It, I agree right? so much. Is, is straight observational training how yes. do you learn perspective you observe <laughs> how do you do how do you learn color and light you observe yeah anatomy. Observe. and also the traditional side of things i think that's the yeah. that's super key because then you can't like undo right like as you can in photoshop so the, so when the, you, yeah the the benefits of the traditional like training is really what it does is like the digital there's so many options right so many softwares millions of colors yeah. millions of brushes millions of shortcuts plugins 3d tricks vr when you only have like a pencil and like a chamois cloth and a, an eraser and like a piece of paper or two like that like yeah the possibilities are still endless yes. but you're not worrying about all these other ex existential factors that are going to be impact. oh what brush am i using and is this the right color no you got you, you just work with what's in front of you and that's how you build those core skills true yeah i mean that, that's and, and also i mean you you get to sort of whatever you put down that's what's put down right you don't mm -hmm. overthink it you just paint man like that that's so crucial like when you do did this um your fan art and all that stuff in high school you didn't think so much about that nope. kind of stuff right you just painted because it was fun and you know it gave you some some pleasure so here a you are you know, that, making your you know, own game having art. Right. Like once, well, once art becomes a business, in a sense, everything does change. And I constantly find myself actively uh, pursuing the, that mentality that I had when I was younger. Like, because if you definitely create for the passion of it 
and just for the pure enjoyment of it, people are going to like the art more. They're going to respond to it better. But it's also harder to kind of reach that too. When okay, I have to make a business model out of this, making this image. How can I promote it on Instagram? How can I monetize it for yeah. prints over here? How can I make a DVD sale off it? You know, whatever right. the case is, it's so, some things kind of change. But ultimately, if you're creating what you're passionate about and 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 have that be the main driving force behind things. Um, it's definitely better. Whereas, or if you're kind of catering your work toward a perceived kind of perception of what you think might be popular, mm. what's trending, um, that can, it can start to bring down the quality and then you could just become like the best kind of copier right. uh, and you know, you're just emulating. What, and you're what's depressed, going on. right? You don't like what you do anymore because yeah. it's gone away from what, what you really like. So Evan, do we yeah. have any, any cool questions for, from the, from the chat? Um, we got a lot of people uh, just saying hi here, and mm -hmm. uh, we had one question here, um, and uh, one person asked, I'm a digital artist, and I've watched a ton of videos slash done courses on artwork, figure drawing, perspective, values, and color, and so on, but uh, is there anything on actually making the marks with digital painting? So maybe like specifically as it comes to, you know, a lot of people asking about like brushes and the importance of that as well. Right. Yeah. Please go ahead, Tyler. This is on you. This <laughs> I, I, oh, well, honestly, that's that's where I find a lot of artists struggle right now. It's kind of like a middle of the road um, kind of game. Like once you kind of get up, maybe your feet wet, right? Just just doing some painting, doing some creating for X amount of time. And uh, there might be some shameless plugging, but I have to. <laughs> that's why it started a chain of videos I did on my YouTube this um, not this or earlier this year like a couple, yeah. like two months ago like what do you do after the fundamentals what do you do beyond that how do you train specific things uh it, and that kind of it, it's about process and a little bit about experimentation um but it like it's such an indirect path and it comes down to so many different personal tastes but there is i'm noticing between many of my students that once they are past the fundamentals, it is 100% that process and, and kind of setting what their standards are and kind of incrementally improving that over time, which is, you know, what, what they were asking about. It's like, okay, I got a painting looking like this level, you know, and, and I always have to ask the student, how do you feel about this? What percent, it, you know, is this you at 100%? You're absolutely like in blackout now. You don't know where to go, what to do with it. But I, and I realize in, often enough, if I deliberately point out some specific things without even like making a mark on their canvas or maybe showing a comparison that with just their technical skill, they can actually go back, make all the changes on their own. And then it, it so it's like, it was always there. It's just, sometimes it's like, you need to see a little bit of that, that, the you know, the end of the tunnel to kind of, and, and that's why I guess why I always, you know, and there's mixed opinions about this online, but like why I, if I'm working on a particular scene, I try to find someone else that already did it, you know, mm. per preferably already did it way better. Right. So that way, that's like the target. I think, Here's my idea. Right. right. I got to hit this. I, th I think that's a really important uh, thing to think about as an artist that you are developing um, is that, um, you know, of course, you shouldn't like copy too much of what other people do, does, but it's really important to learn what they have done before that is better than what you do today, right? Because you're a beginner, you should learn what the masters did. Like Edgar Payne, you know, that, that's one of the things we're doing in the challenge. Uh, you did this that kind of like blocks there where you can make a composition based off of these these shape language things that we can look through later. But, um, but basically, you could look through what they have done better and just learn from that. Like how, how are they making their marks? How are they using composition? And, and kind of copy that, but it will still be yours because you still have your own style. You still have your own influences and your own, you know, foundation. So I definitely can, can agree I, with that. Could I show a quick example of this? Please, just please do. Swap the screen. I have, I have something just kind of came up on, on standby. All right, let me, yes. let me know when, when it's shared. Cool. By the way, guys, you can ask any questions you want. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, please, you, you have this opportunity here to, to, to ask a professional artist anything you need uh let's see so how do we know when our f oh evan do you want to take this one <laughs> go ahead we should should sure, we do <laughs> go ahead we do have a question here um right mih fpv is asking how do we know when our fundamentals are good enough so we can proceed to learn more of the design things 
uh, maybe, maybe the question could be like when, uh, I mean, wh when are fundamentals good enough? Do we ever have to stop working on those or can we just, <laughs> you know, or is that yeah. a lifelong thing? Yeah, it, it, it is. And it comes back to you, you know, in different ways, you know, like the, like even after I was working a couple of years as a professional and, you know, I got, I hit a few years where I was like kind of ignoring a lot of what people were talking about in regards to fundamentals, not like, like the, the raw theory of it, but just like, I was not actively trying to pay attention to some things because I was, what I was doing was seemingly working, but you know, I wasn't growing at all. And when I became an instructor and had to teach it and I felt responsible, right? A certain level of responsibility for being able to present information in a clear way, that really made me realize how much I didn't know at all mm. or how much like some of that I yeah. took for granted or came natural. But like when you actually like have to learn it and stuff, it's it's like a, a game changer because like it starts filling gaps that I had massive holes in. And my work over time then, you know, hit past those plateaus I was hitting in, in you know, 2013, 2014 mm. and started getting much better, but, you know, by 2017 even. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It's like the fundamentals, if you have those settled, like if you have mastered them, you're a master, honestly. You can you can paint beautiful, masterful paintings. So it never ends, the whole like learning what makes something beautiful, right? So I think let's start with that, like right, go, go transition from, from that to... Um, something you can share with us here, Tyler. Maybe you can share your screen and... Uh, yeah, it, it, do I have to hit present or anything? I think yeah, share screen. Can you, can you click okay, that I on Zoom? It. Yeah, all right. So to answer that, the previous question, right, about like determining what's finished, brush stroke and stuff. And this is a lot that kind of comes up with a lot of student stuff. So I've been working on this image this week, you know, just a kind of cool fantasy scape, but just to kind of show you different levels at different things and different levels of finish. So this was like a previous version about 90 minutes earlier. So then eh, maybe, maybe two hours earlier, right? So this is like the same picture, right? Nothing structurally or even fundamentally really changes, right? When it's zoomed out, reads exactly the same. Nothing really, you know, is changing in that regard. It's just essentially what's happening with Mark and, you know, Mark making brush strokes and stuff. They get a bit tinier right? They're getting more precise um, and you're getting more like meticulous with detail. And, and what a lot of it, you know, really it, it's coming down to is it, well, I guess they refer to it traditionally as like just rendering, you know, like where you have to like, like, I guess this is, let me find a good example in here. See, like with like some of the shrubs, right. That I was, they, it just didn't exist at all. I was just kind of implying them. And that's like a first pass for a shrub. If I really had the time, you could dive in and get even like, you know, smaller and smaller and more specific, um, you know, with, with certain things like that. Or in the grass, you could start to see on the grass here, right? I started getting just more specific, more calculated, more precise. And and this is why it's such a big open door, because like what one person considers done or finished is entirely different uh, from, from another. Like against part of style comes into that. Like how do, do you want to do something more expressive, more painterly? Do you want to do something super tight, super refined, mm. or, you know, or is it, you're going to play up abstraction and really just, you know, kind of get really loose with things. And, and I think when, once you get to a level where your mind is equally as trained as your hand, meaning like, okay, if I have infinite amount of time and I can sit here and I just, you know, add another, like I up res it one more time. Okay. I can start like making these globs that are rocks, they're kind of globby at this stage. I've been neglecting them. But like I could get, if I spent a little time, I could get more specific, right? Like like up there in yep. the castle, like this is just a cube. And then, okay, now I'm getting specific. And if I wanted to like, cause we mentioned earlier about comparing your work to someone else that that might be similar. Now, if I actually compared this to a completely finished, you know, insane piece, right? Like something from Lorenzo here, he does super, t you know, super tight, super detailed images. So like, you know, he's, kind enough to share some of his process. A lot of students get to about right here, sometimes not even think it's done, but it's like, as long as you're actively aware and that's a conscious decision, like, hey, this is done because I want it to be done, not because I have no other clue what to do to it, right? But like, it's like, okay, I'm, if I'm gonna push for finish and I'm gonna get in there, noodle out all those little brush strokes so they look like nice, elegant blades of grass, like you can push detail 
you know, till there's no end, as you can kind of see. And I just chose him as an example because he, he is meticulous with that. So if I compared what I'm doing here to him, like, yeah, like it looks like a, a hot mess in areas. But a lot of what I like about this is that I'm avoiding going into that level of detail because I'm I I don't have the time for one to do that. But I'm also trying to say more with less on my own standards. So like if I mm. if I can kind of get the same idea across, but with like two dozen less hours for me, that's good enough. You know, so you got to We all got to set our own standards I, and what I, we want to achieve. Right. Yeah. I, I think that really speaks to the maturity of an artist when you can say a lot more with a lot less. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and you can do that here, like you said before, even if you spend like, let's say you spend like five hours more on this thing, it would probably look kind of the same when you squint your eyes yeah. a little bit, right? So 100% look the same. Yeah. I, I call it like it, you start to hit a curve of like diminishing returns for time investment once right. it's because like half the time anyway, right? You give it the Instagram test. So that means you got to make it like about that big. Mm. Does it look good? Because that's how like a majority of the audience you know, whether it's a thumbnail on Facebook, whether it's a thumbnail on ArtStation, or whether it's, you know, that size on Instagram, majority of the people will ever just really kind of see it for that size. Yeah. So does it look good like that is the, the big question. Good point. So do we have any questions uh, from um, from the chat? Any, any, I mean, we have a lot. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, we got a lot. All um, right. So uh, maybe we can, we can do a couple here. Um, I think a, a quick one here is uh, Elaine is asking, uh, when deciding on a composition, do you have multiple thumbnails to choose from? If so, how many do you create? What are the deciding factors for you on finalizing a composition thumbnail? Awesome. Um, I don't know about you, you fellas, but for me, it, it, it differs every single time. And it depends just what kind of mood I'm in, what I'm trying to achieve out of, like, yeah. do I have an hour block of time or a two hour block of time, or maybe even 30 minutes and like what I want to specifically get. So for me, and I think that's one of the, what I like most about my workflows is that I never really do work exactly the same way. Uh, I, all the fundamentals stay the same, of course, but like, I get like, sometimes it's just, I'm in the mood to do some thumbnails and I'll, and I often, if you're, if you're going to sit down to do thumbnails, which I actually recommend because it's more efficient, um, just do them until you're content with what the results are. Like, don't, don't even set a limit. Hey, I got to do four. I got to do six. Just, just go to your feeling it because that's what composition really is at the end of the day. It's There's no right or wrong composition, but it's about what is best for your idea. So I always you know, answer the question specifically. It's like I go with a composition that represents what I'm trying to deliberately say in the absolute clearest sort of way. Yeah, I like that answer a lot. Nothing really to add there. You can go through there more, Evan. Nice. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have another one. Uh, Sam Reeves has a few questions here. Um, one oh, is, hey, Sam. <laughs> I know Sam. he's, uh, asking how important is it to niche down in subject matter? Uh, do you have to just be a portrait artist or a landscape artist? Uh, should you segregate your portfolio? Um, is it good generally to have a wide breadth of things or to, to focus on one thing in the industry? Well, okay, so this is, Sam, of course, this has come from me, a bit of a generalist, but I guess, you know, so m my opinion comes from that perspective, but I still say, like, the, the people that are absolutely killing it in terms of just, like, their representation, their brand, and how popular they are, if you kind of measure those three things, the people that do that are absolute specialists. They have, they, they're kind of like one-trick ponies in a sense that they do one thing and they do it damn good. And to kind of pedal back a step, I would say just get good at really one thing. Like for me, it was environments. And it, like, if you're like me and still interested in a bunch of other things, just kind of work on that as well. But put a majority of the effort first and foremost in what you want to specialize in. That way, at least you have some, because I guess that's when you start getting work and stuff was when you're, you hit a certain skill level with something and somebody wants to pay you for that service. So it, the growth would be slower if you're diversifying so, so much. Mm -hmm. um, and you can learn by focusing, you know, extra. So you can like focus the learning and that way the growth could be potentially, potentially faster. I know because it's, it's, it's a very hard thing to measure. Mm, I agree with that for sure, Spe specializing. But the thing, the thing I want to stress there uh, is that you should specialize, but also in what you really like to do, right? Like you said yes. there, what really, what really motivates you? If, if it's environment, then go go with environments, you know, 
become really good at that and specialize at that because that's what that's what will drive your portfolio further to getting more gigs or characters or whatever it is you do just do it what you love and what you really like doing yep. that will really help everything else you know becoming better at it and making good portfolios yeah and so great pay attention to what you feel like you're forcing too much what you know some of us some things come easier than others as well mm. um some people are just like really good at drawing figures without yeah. having a single anatomy lesson and, and you know some people are just are really good at drawing expressive skyscapes or or you know double they put double the effort in their foliage and they just like love doing leaves and right. nature, and, and that's just like what calls to them so, so the, the better you know yourself yeah you know through experimentation and through just like being really being open-minded and willing to close some doors to open up others you know that that's where a lot of it is 100%. it's a lot of inner searching for us as creators yeah so talking about like what what other people uh, do you know other artists what are some of the sort of biggest mistakes or what what, what do you think that people make what, what mistakes do they make when they approach composition they approach their paintings they're just gonna start making a cool scene or something mm -hmm. what are some of the mistakes that you see them do and how can they fix that a lack of clarity is the biggest thing uh, cause I just ran, you know, one of my courses on the design fundamentals and one week we specifically just go into composition. It's not enough to talk about composition, but we kind of, it's, it's a very kind of entry level course where I talk about all facets of design. So one week is everything, but again, for the, for the compositional stuff, one of the things I see them, I saw the most this term was that just people weren't exactly clear in their drawing like the drawing should be very self-explanatory on is in a sense of what it's about and there's numerous factors you know that you can decide or or kind of play up in terms of like what that you know may or may not be so like i got one thing here's a, i i'm still okay i put the the screen share on i don't know if it was still going but definitely yeah right no emphasis or focal point so here's a very simple example like if you have a basic hill right and then two trees it's like okay that's great but again there's there's no emphasis going on right whatsoever this scene is maybe like equal equally about these two trees that doesn't make it bad or it doesn't make it even you know worse in in some regards but like if you're really clear and what you want to, okay, i want it just to be about nature and i want it to be about the majesticness of this tree well let's create a visual hierarchy you know take the same structure we'll make one bigger set one a little further back make it smaller so at least now okay, we got a little bit of emphasis going on and it starts to add a little bit more clarity. Um, and then of course, if, if you can make a dynamic weaving path of rocks or a hill, or you know, you wanna play up a shadow to lead to it, you know, in a subtle way that doesn't feel too forced or maybe even bring in like a cloud line, you know, that elegantly swoops through it. You know, it, it'll start to make, er this whole scene will exist to service the tree. You know, like if you think of composition like a stage play, you have the spotlight on the main actor, you have the props and all kinds of lighting going around behind the scenes that emphasize that you know whoever has the the scene at the moment and that's what it's really good to do with any kind of composition whether it's figurative base whether it's landscapes you know whether it's illustration um is find something to emphasize or or just to deliberately create a focal point that will de uh, deliver what your particular message is hmm. and a lot of that right can come from just like Again, like even choosing a camera angle. So it's 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 choosing what to emphasize, choosing a camera angle that services what you want to say. And I like this example because it's just so simple, right? It's just a cue. But this is the most common thing, you know. I see even with the old, my, the uh, the challenges that I run over on my Discord is that m nine out of ten angles that that a student will make is something like this, where it's just it, the camera doesn't tell us what to think or what to feel. But you can start manipulating the viewer at that fundamental level, right? So a low angle shot, for example, makes something feel epic or imposing, or maybe even heroic, right? Or a down, you know, a downward and tilted angle will make something height, depth, um, or maybe a specific mm. action. Where if you do a high horizon, you can show an, a vastness. So, 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 sorry for interrupting you, but but just the, oh. the, all this kind of stuff that you were talking about, like you know, communicate more with that with camera. Um, think a bit more about um, clarity sort of so 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 with that like with, with those kind of principles how does someone who's like a beginner or intermediate how do they how do they approach that whole sort of thing as as artists do, do they start learning about it like separately or do they start thinking about those things when they're painting or before or 
What are your thoughts on that? I think it's something that's going to come a little like in in waves over time because like, a lot of people you can watch a video on on this that just right it discloses all the information right i'll spell it all out hand it on hand it to the the viewer the student on a platter but for them to actually implement that and implement it with little effort that that just takes practice which you know takes time some of them you'll get instantly and, and others you have to like okay get a sec get a second of feedback ask your friends hey does this what is this about but mm. the one question right we want to ask ourselves about you know before we start drawing before we start painting and definitely remind yourself during the process is what is this image about you know right. what am i trying to feel from i like that what do i what right what do i want the viewer definitely to feel from it 100 percent agree with that like think about like what you want to do here don't don't just aimlessly go and make art i mean sure you can do that but but mm -hmm. but you want to have some idea like do i want to make a beautiful like the one you made before the beautiful green landscape you had an idea before right yeah you know what yeah. what to do so cool man so Evan, I sh I'm sure we have a lot of questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so what? Yeah, shoot. Yeah, I think uh, specifically, you know, while we're on the, the lighting thing, um, Nathan is asking what's the best way to graduate from a move from white lighting one object with one light source, like a prop or a box like this here, or uh, to figure out lighting for a more immersive scene, like with more objects or like a landscape scene, you know, how does that scale? Again, gradually, right? Like if you're feeling good and confident, right, about a, a singular light source, you know, image, let's say whether it's a full character, whether it's a, um, you know, a, a, like a, a complex one with just some shrubs from rocks and a tree and it's got one light source, uh, just over time, you can, you can either change the parameters, right, in a very controlled way, add more objects in or add more light sources in. And, you know, embrace like, okay, the first couple are going to be a little rough because I have, because the complexity gets when how they interact with each other, right? Either the various objects are casting shadows on each other or bouncing light onto each other. And a lot of that just comes down to just knowing the core fundamentals or the art, well, the principles of lighting, you know, mm. and how light behaves and how it reacts to different types of materials, which is like a whole other, you know, lesson and discipline in itself. But again, it's something that you just get the gears turning as early as you can, being mindful of it, knowing that it exists, and then maybe having specific days where you're practicing lighting, then you're going to practice composition. How, do, how, do, how do you practice lighting? Well, through a lot of observation and I think controlling the scenario for like what you want to do. So like, I guess the traditional, really, right, the best way, you set a couple objects up in the corner of your room, you toss a flashlight on, you either work right in front of it or you just take a, you know, you know, of course you can take a photo, take it back to your desk if you're going to do it digitally and then work from there and try. But I guess what a lot of people, a lot of students don't do enough of is that they just try to mindlessly copy that photo and they, they just try to like go one for one, which is just training a copying skill, right? Mm -hmm. But like if you're actually trying to deconstruct the image and ask yourself, okay, this is looking like this. Why does it look like this? Mm. And how is that, right? If you just start connecting the, so in a sense of going slow, don't make it a race. Um, mm. Learning art and studying should never really be a race. So if you actually just slow down and then try to like deconstruct in your head, what's going on in a scene? What is the angle of the light? How does that affect the shadow? What is the temperature of that? How does, how does the temperature of the light and the shadow kind of play off each other in terms of like, is it warm? Is it cool? How can I, you know, build this up from neutrals or how much of this image is desaturated versus how much is in full saturation. Right. Yep. It's just like practicing it. Mm. Uh, there's, it, you can just draw cubes. Like you set up a couple white blocks, you drop a light on 3d is great. You know, like a software, like blender, you can just make a bunch of circles, cones and squares, mm -hmm. you know, add a sun in and then rotate it. So you can basically get an infinite scene generator and, and just, you know, screen cap it, take it back, try to study it. And then, implementation try right. to you know do it with no light on in the scene and then calculate on your own that's what i have a lot of my students do like okay if the lighting's coming from this way with mm. no reference try to figure out and there's mathematical ways to like calculate shadows and stuff yeah there's books on that i've been never one like do you think I we did, need like, that one as artists <laughs> on it once and i'm just like it took yeah. like 20 minutes to calculate one for for a geometric right. shape and i'm like yeah <laughs> i mean you just kind of need to know understand it you know not yeah. a mastery not even like a deep comprehension, but you know, it's like, okay, if the light's coming from the left at that angle, it it's safe to say, right? It should kind of look down like proper, this, right? right? <laughs> you yeah. assume. 
Cool, man. So, so is there any other question on uh, on that or on on lighting or com or or that or is there anything else? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's some other stuff we can go into here. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I think I think it does. I definitely learned something there. Yeah, like yeah, light lighting exercises. I I can if give me a sec. I can bring up. Um, yeah, maybe share something a, we could do here with. I had a sheet uh, that I had some various. I, I think they're in. I think it's in this folder. At pardon. Sorry, guys, about uh, like not maybe. All right, catching right here, here's yeah. here's on my screen, right? This is what I put together for some of my patrons, right? Some beginner, intermediate, and advanced exercises that you can practice for color, right? So, and like the first block, just do the deliberate one-to-one -one time study, and I, and even though I just said to slow down with these, I, it's also important that some of these types of studies are time, so you're not figuring out or you're not painting details and you're not trying to, it's not about rendering. Remember it's about color, which you can represent color in very big and very blocky brush strokes on very small canvases. So 10 minutes on a time study, just going one-to-one -one, there's always, it's always a great assignment, you know, especially too, if you are honest about it and don't color pick. Um, yes. And then, <laughs> Good one. you know, and this is kind of like a simple geometric sets. We just talked about these, whether it's an interior set, or one that's set up kind of, you know, just in, in its own generic environment. And then how you can escalate that is like, okay, imagine, okay, these aren't necessarily blocks anymore, but maybe these are ruins on a beach. And that's where you can let your creativity, right, and your imagination start to take over. Mm. Now, these, these ones here are intermediate, right? You can grab two different photos. And this is what a large part of art and design actually is, is linking two ideas, two, two different pieces of information you know, two different refs and combining them to service your picture. So I, like in this example, I grab, I don't know where that went. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> I, I thought it was open in Photoshop, but apparently it wasn't. So yeah, like essentially here, right. I grab like this Miami nights misty scene and like a food shack, but, and then I tried to design my own picture in a sense that combined the lighting and co the components essentially of both. Yeah. Same with this. Like I took a, a master painter and then a stock photo of a fish hanging in a, sh in a shack. And I tried to build a little painting from these two pieces of information. Um, and then another great one is like just taking any kind of painting, whether it's someone else's concept, a photo, and just relight it. Just mm. take the core composition, keep it at the same, but try to do a completely different mood or lighting based off that. And that's a great way to kind of practice in a very kind of, again, controlled sort of way. And then like once, once you're comfortable enough with this, just get some references and go to full invent your own scenes like mm -hmm. i invented this one from that i invented this one from this and you know invented this one from like this and this so it's you can ex you know gradually increase the intensity right. and the challenge of that i i guess something that's important to talk about here is also like pe people ask like how, how do i get better at making making lights like or or perspective or something like that like they, they always have these um these special things that, that, they, that they talk about but what I'm seeing, like overall, I'm not sure what you think about this, but I think more people should just focus on just painting, right? Like, yeah. like just put in the time and make some art, and then you'll you realize, like, okay, so maybe I'm behind on the on the on the color and the narrative. You know, what? How, how does the light work here? Then you can go into this kind of stuff, and then you can sort of learn specifically about light itself, or color itself, or perspective, or where it is. You do, but I, th I think a lot of people are focusing a lot on, you know, the perspective or specific elements when they should be th thinking about the whole, right? Just painting. What do you think about that? Yeah, like, and, and there's certain times where I think that that's a huge part of it. And if you focus on specific parts at a, at a time throughout the, the creation process, right, you can, like, you shouldn't be trying to tackle color and light and perspective in terms of problem solving right at the same exact time first just solve composition then figure out what your perspective needs to do so you you can take that you know even if you wanted to do like an image a week right a nice good completed image a week take the first day to practice and drill out what that idea is so focus on what that idea is and what's the best mm -hmm. way to say it which you can lead to thumbnailing and compositional practice so don't worry about texture don't worry about color you know don't worry about how pretty it is just idea generating stuff then you can like day two drill and practice what perspective yeah. is best yeah. for that idea that makes day sense. three value blocking and you yeah. can like turn a singular image into like a five 
day or four day whatever exercise set where you're where you're compartmentalizing the task mm. breaking it down into much smaller manageable chunks because again that's going to come back to process which is like what a lot of intermediate artists start to you know run into because they understand oh i know what a cool color is i know what a warm color is i know what light and shadow is mm. i know what movement is but it's like finding a process that works for them that allows them to manage those fundamentals is what's really um the key part of that st uh, that phase that makes sense yeah for sure hey can we by the way just see like how you can you explain a little bit how you made that uh first painting you did there like the the big sort of like landscape there because that that's pretty advanced like when you think about it you know there's lots of art there's lots of um, lighting going on uh there's lots yeah. of uh, stuff happening there so can you Let's ever just break it down yeah just walk us through a little bit how you make that painting and think All about right. the composition around it luckily this was slightly planned so i have it on recording brilliant Let's bring it up awesome <laughs> fire this thing up so again like like i was mentioning earlier on from the, one of the early questions this is one of those scenarios where i had an idea but no plan and so with that said the idea was i'm going to do a castle with a valley and i kept it that simple like not that that's just me not everything <laughs> uh, but so i i start in in this case this is like okay that's four minutes in the first thing i always decide with or without a plan is the horizon line. I wasn't committed to the time of day on this or the color. So if if I'm a little hot, and for me, this is like a free sketch. I just wanted to practice, just wanted to loosen up and kind of see where things take me. Um, in, in a perfect world, yeah, I would thumbnail that out or I would plan it out a bit more. I, you know, I had some references, yeah, sure. Like I, I could get some castles and things, but for the most part, the first part of composition you know, of course, it's choosing the angle that's appropriate for your subject. So again, I was kind of going for something a little complex because I wanted it to feel majestic and important. So I wanted to put it up high, but I also wanted the horizon line high enough to say that this is a big, vast area. So I'm trying to play off those two notions. And so for me, that's what would, dis uh, for me to decide, that's where the horizon's going, right? Where the blue is. So I added a seascape and with no intention of actually ever including it, but just so I know, like that could, the bottom could be grass, it could be water, it didn't matter. And then I'm just going in and I place the core, uh, the focal point, like, okay, this is my castle, right? And as you could see, it's every good castle just starts as a primitive shape. In my case, it was a rectangle. And then I can add other tinier rectangles, secondary shapes to that if I want to add any kind of complexity. And so really here, uh, one part that this is working for me, I literally only use one brush at this stage. It's kind of like a, like a little bit of a flat, I guess it's the equivalent of a traditional filibert sort of brush mm. but it it allows me it's enough it's flexible enough that i can get some nice thick and thins with it when, especially when i rotate it and i just limit the tools um in that regard at least earlier in the stage so i get this nice thick blocky sort of look um as i'm kind of figuring this out so i'm like okay castle it's shooting out of the sky whatever it, and then it right we got a hill so i'm keeping the lighting as neutral and as generic at this stage so I can kind of sort out what the idea is going to be. And like one, once that is in place, you know, which you'll see, then I'm like, okay, I, I actually take a step back. Maybe I went to bed and I came back to say, it's like, all right, I got to actually sort out what I'm going to do with this lighting. So you, you, the easiest thing to do is like, okay, you drop direct light into this, which is you actually have a, a, you know, a physical sunlight hitting part of your object. And if you have it hit part of the object, let's say like 30% of your object and have 70% shadow, that's a good safe ratio to like, just make it pop. That's, that's an easy solution. More neutral color palettes that, you know, simulate overcast paintings or like, you know, where after just rain, something like that. Those are actually a little bit harder to pull off because you don't get that direct sort of contrast that you do um, with having direct light in the scene. Usually direct lighting is just very easy to make interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of like thinking of that in my head at this stage, like, you know, am I gonna, am I gonna do that? Or am I not gonna do that? I didn't know. Um, and then I just start figuring out, okay, that's kind of like in the mid ground, the sky's the background. How can I lead the viewer to that castle? That's a hundred percent at this point, what I'm focusing on. And like, how can I block out the remainder of the shapes to supplement and get that, that castle working? So this actually went through numerous stages. Sorry, I got a dog up there. So like, <laughs> at, at, at this point, right, add in, add in a bit of a bridge. I'm like, okay, let's let's do that, Let, and then let's cut out some sweet shapes, and so we can introduce and have 
a bridge scape, which, you know, if we make, uh, if we make it thin enough, we can kind of have a nice cut through and, and see a little bit of maybe that ocean that that's still back there. So I made a little stencil, I right? cut it out. And now we got a little bit of depth there, which is always fun. And then just go back and, you know, add a little bit of width to, um, to the bridge. You're like, okay, but that, that works. And then I, I, I kept going with that. I, I, you know, of course at this problem, at this point, right, there's nothing going on here at all. So that's a huge problem. And I was like, okay, I have to make an interesting enough aspect or component of this image to make, to kind of fill that space, but to also create that movement to potentially get the viewer's eye right so, about here. Cause like, right. I just want to inter interrupt it a little bit. So as you go through all this kind of stuff, you, ha you have an idea in your head, you want to do a castle, beautiful mm -hmm. green landscape is a bright scene. I mean, it seems to me that you, you, you just, you know, take it as it comes kind of like, what does this need right now? Do, can I do yes. this? You experiment a bit and, and there's no like actual, you know, super uh, strict process for how you do it. You just try things out and you just paint, yeah. right? It, this, this image in particular is a hundred percent of me just playing. Like I don't necessarily approach a, a bulk of client work like that. I, you know, you want to go through and provide thumbnails for them. You want to have a strategy so you can be the most efficient with your time. And I knew like you guys seen this when it looked like when it was done, not representative at all what's going on here. But part of that, like you said, is just kind of when if I'm playing and having fun on a good image like this, I just I want to let what comes comes and really what I'm asking myself at any one of these phases. And this gets a little bit deeper. It's it's at, at this stage, I'm kind of more or less comfortable with the technical side of things. Like I know if I devote X amount of time, I can get this looking like I need to. So what I'm really trying to work on is is more about what I'm trying to say and how I'm saying that. It, that's still like such an important part for me because I'm, I'm, I can shut off the technical side of it. I'm yeah. using one tool in limited colors. So nothing saturated. It's pretty much all blues and greens. And where I'm asking myself is really, what is the pinnacle of my desire? You know, when I'm adding this, this slope or I'm adding this shape, right. or I'm adding a rock here. Like how can I really manifest the best shape possible based off what I'm trying to, you know, in this case, funnel that viewer's eye you know, so at some point or another up into here that way, because I know if I get the viewer to look here, we can shoot them over to the door. That makes so a lot of sense. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a subtle expression of movement. And I'm but I'm constantly digging deep to ask myself, like, what can I get out of this? Right. And how can it how can it really service that as an idea? And what you know, what is the one thing I want the most out of what's in front of me? You mm. know, out of like, I, I'm not thinking about the castle, the sky, but like just these little patches of rock. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm like strangling these things in my right. head. I'm like, what is, what, what are you going to say to me? How, how can I get the best little rock, you know, in this ecosystem that I yeah. possibly can to help the greater picture? So, okay. So, so kind of like now we kind of see how you start the whole painting. Um, if you could just like, you know, slowly go through, how do you sort of progress to, be, to getting, yeah, to like just this, this looks so good. How, how yeah, do you get to this? This is a half hour in. And right. yeah, I was like playing with the skies. So luckily I had, it was digital. And again, that, that can add or, or subtract from certain artistic problems and growth because <laughs> you have infinite amount of flexibility. And so this essentially was an entirely different painting that I just painted out in the process of what I came at, you know, it, but part of that, right. Is not settling because I didn't do thumbnails or anything, not settling for your first idea. And for me personally, I, I like to emphasize it. I like, I love not, you know, getting attached to any one piece of art or any idea so much that it, you know, it creates anxiety. It creates a lot of anxiety for students that I work with. Uh, they, they put some kind of expectation, you know, on, on themselves or they're trying to hit a certain level. But like once, once expectations are, you know, overtaking your, yourself and you want to commit to, to what this is, it, it can be, it can hinder mm. your, your yeah. progression and growth quite a bit. Definitely. So it, Evan, do, do, do we have any, any questions about this so far? Like anything about his process, about Tyler's way of going at it or anything like that or any other yeah. questions really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I think, you know, maybe we'll be getting to this in a minute here. So, uh, but I think, uh, a, a couple different people are asking sort of variations on like, when do you know a piece is, is finished? Like when, when do you know that cutoff time or like, is, do you have a specific uh, sort of metric you use? Like, would you would would you be able to look at this now and call it finished, or you know, how do you know how much more work you need to put into it? 
I think that I guess the ideal answer is if it makes you happy. Right? If it makes you <laughs> right, if it makes you yeah. happy and you're content with it, right? Like, I like that, sure, man. leave it as is. Yeah. Um, right, because it's it's nothing you can absolutely measure. It, it, the other thing, it's done when it's due. You know, is it? Right. Is, do I have to get this into the client by tomorrow morning? Oh, sure, I could easily yeah. put ten more hours into this, <laughs> but it's due today, so it's done. It's done. Today. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's external factors. Like, oh, my kids are coming downstairs. Painting's done. Maybe I'll come back to it. Maybe I won't, you know? So it's just like, I, I try to get a painting as far as I can in the short amount of time and not worry about things like details or an overemphasis. Like nothing's textured here. Nothing's detailed here. I'm simply just kind of playing with shapes form and not even really so much lighting. And that's why I'm going back and forth between a lot of these things. Cause like, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of a lot of those things, but like for me, like if I was like, okay, I'm just going to sit down to do an hour sketch that would be done it would fill that block of time and what i desired you know from mm. it. but like hey if i'm making a new portfolio piece that's going to light the internet up well i gotta double down <laughs> i gotta put a lot more planning and a lot more effort in how that's going to play out yeah so it's it's different for every image and it's it's it depends right what you want to get out of it you know, I 100 you wanna, agree with that. You know, really put loads of detail in something. Do you yeah. want to make a cover photo for your art station? You know, yeah, it's that, what it's for, right? Attract attention. Is it a study? Is it is it your main portfolio piece? You know that kind of stuff. But but like you said, when you're happy with it, <laughs> I think that that when sums it happy. up. It, are it you happy with this painting? Yeah. It, it turns out a lot, I'm, not, I'm not ever happy with my work because it's like yeah. ideally I would have got to put in you know, five to ten more hours into everything. But right. Yeah. Like, I got like it's so many ideas. You're a dad now. Like, you can't do that. No, I, I can't do it. And that's why I'm work. I used to work a lot more detailed, and 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 why I'm learning 3D now on the side mm. because th that that expedites the process. You can yeah. kind of see it pop up in the beginning here. This that that was a client piece that oil rig. I thought it was in the, in the first like four seconds, right? Um, that was a client piece I was working on that day. Oh yeah, right. And that would dictate a very different process. I, I drew out a layout. I had to plan mm -hmm. what was going to be where. I had to get the composition approved. And then I just get in the 3D to like kind of figure out how to light and, and shape yeah. a lot of this. And so it's a very different process depending what the intent is. Mm. Cool, man. So yeah, that's, uh, that's a really awesome uh, answer yeah, like, to, the whole, to the whole thing. Um, yeah, once it was like at this level, then I was like, okay, I want warm light to kind of come in and hit the bit of the castle wall where it sticks out because that's an easy way to get attention. So everything's cool and neutral, but the moment you, you see you start to toss in some warm light on that, you know how that works. It, it It's going to make it pop quite a bit more in this little ecosystem. And then, see, sometimes I just play with it. I just drop, you know, these psychedelic colors all over the place and then see what I can simplify. Like, what can I haze out? A focus to service that wall it's always this is always about that that damn wall in that picture and glorifying it in in all its in all its essence man that's beautiful yeah please please continue all the way until the end there what happens after yes. here like so so, so, so what, what are the main processes there so, so you started with the first sort of sketch you don't really know where you're going you have an idea and then it turned into this um, well you built it okay so now you have yep. something to go off of and then you you put in some stuff like what about clouds? Okay, clouds are cool. And you put in clouds, and then now you put in these cool colors, and you're saying, oh wow, that that really helped. So like, what happens after this? How do you actually end up to to the final piece that you have there? Yeah, I was like finding shortcuts to service the idea. So right, goal number one, make this stand out. Goal number two is not take a week on this. So. The clouds were a great way to solve both those problems. So it's it's all it was all strategic in a very I love clouds. Uh, like they're sense, amazing. Right? <laughs> clouds were a great way. Yeah. I didn't have to paint loads of detail. Yeah. Rocks take longer than clouds to paint in most scenarios, especially if you can get away with a wispy cloud with a little bit of movement like this guy here. Mm. That was just like airbrush mark, drag it out. And then I don't have to worry about that. And it's also creating a little expression of movement to get the viewer, you know, over to here, and then we can take them up the hill to the main. Mm you know, to the main keep. But yeah, clouds, I'm using them strategically for movement to balance detail density. So I'm not equally defying, uh, the, you know, uh, painting up the whole scene and it's budgeting my time. So they, there's a reason for every little thing. And of course I wanted to show how big this is by having like a little quaint town uh, going down into the valley. So yeah. again, I want I'm, these buildings are here to serve this, to make this feel more important and, and more majestic. And eventually I think, you know, in part two, right i started 
you know, playing with the idea of sculpting out shapes or other towers to make it feel, you know, larger than life as well. Like maybe there's a system or a particular purpose beyond our means. And that's part of what I try to do all, all my work. I like to incite a little bit of sensation of wonder into my pictures and having a few more towers, absolutely not detailed at all, that kind of play and funnel through the valley is a great way to kind of play with that expectation. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, that, that's a really cool insight into your workflow. Um, I definitely have learned some some cool stuff from you here. Um, <laughs> Adam Thornton oh. says, can we do this every day, please? <laughs> if only we could, man. I mean, ah, yeah, we have a dad take, here. If you take my kids for a week, <laughs> every day at two. <laughs> yeah. So, so, oh so Evan, is there any, like, let, let's say we, we can do two more questions and then we can wrap it up. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that'll be enough for, for today. Sure. Um, I think maybe we can sort of, uh, you know, combine a few of them. There's a lot of sort of specifics about mm -hmm. about composition here, but uh, maybe to, to kind of summarize, like if you had, uh, if you were to sort of give one uh, general tip on how beginner artists can can improve their compositions quickly, you know, what would you suggest to them? There's a few very basic things. I'm glad you asked. There's a few basic things you can remember. Uh, I have them in this important slide over here. So, right, we talked about communication, figure out what the message is you're trying to deliver. That's always a big thing. One of the most basic trips you can do on top of that is maximize overlaps, right? And this is something I see often enough. So, right, not so good. You just have three images, right? Three pieces, equal emphasis. They're all lined up. Mm -hmm. There's, there's nothing going on with them. But the second you start taking shapes and you overlapping them to various degrees, that'll instantly make your picture more appealing because it's going to, you know, it's, it's going to have depth to it. This it's hard to show depth when nothing really overlaps. It, the space becomes quite limited and it's very easy principle. Like what comes in front of what the most basic thing. Um, that's, so that's a dirty trick as, as simple <laughs> as it is. And hmm. the other thing, um, is framing, right? If, if, if you were to just, I think that's more of a cinematography and, and, uh, uh, what's it called photography itself uh lessons like just framing like how you frame okay i know what the subject is what's the best way to frame it you know do i want to put it in the center will that will having it in the center help you know make that the best thing that it is or should i offset it or should i put it lower or higher right so part of part of all of this is framing so i had two examples here right where these are from submissions from one of my last challenges uh, or earlier a few months ago right so very cool ideas right we got ships we got a guys we got a market we got mountains um and again we have ruined trains and we got like a cool little vigil cult thing going on but these are like really cool ideas they could be in my opinion improved a bit by help delivering what they're about a little bit clearer mm. often enough that just is cutting out the fat which is what framing does like how can you frame that subject it's like okay, I'm taking a picture of me is like, what's over there or what's over there gonna make my portrait better today? Absolutely not. Unless it's another lighting, you know, or a rim light or something, but uh, most things will not. So like, what can you cut from your scene without compromising that message? So in this case, I just simply, you know, made things a little bit brighter, a little bit lighter. And I upscaled and like reposition. Let's just focus on that bottom one. Cause that's what I looked at first. Right. So see, just having that shape push out this shape, which is, We'll, we'll talk about that in a second yeah. and then you know playing up color temperature nice cool to accent the warms and we lost a lot of fat on that composition see we don't have any of this stuff none of this stuff we just and essentially just zoomed in and then amped up what was there mm -hmm. didn't have to change anything really like in regards to this one a little bit trickier but you know a lot of it was about seemingly the interaction right between this this character and this character mm -hmm. so let's just make it about that so now we again you can frame in a very kind of Photoshop lasso chopped up way, just have that character and that maybe even move that character over there a bit more. But again, lose a lot of the fat on there and emphasize this moment, make it about that moment and the composition will be even stronger. Yeah. Clar clarify more what you mean there. Like yeah. The, it's absolute you know? clarity is the biggest thing. And sometimes, I, I mean, the, the other big, the last tip I would have is just the staticness of something, right? So again, this is a really cool submission from a thing right it's a really cool idea we got a medieval street scene right very detailed mm. um and you have like a cool castle floating up above with all this stuff going on sometimes it, it can be how something is drawn you know if it's all very synthetically up and down perfectly straight or maybe it's in this case which i wanted to focus on was the lighting the lighting yeah. is like 
good, but and again, like maybe to get the idea that there's something otherworldly going on here and that this is a huge influence. Like a scene, a scene like this seems to be about this, but nothing down here is supporting that, which is what we were talking about earlier. So by changing the lighting, we can really make it Definitely. about yes. what this is. 100%. And that will improve and enhance the, the story that you're trying to convey all through composition. Definitely. Like we didn't really move anything. We just relit it. Yeah, I think that's really, really important there. So, so Evan, is there anything, anything else? Any last questions here before we just wrap up? Uh, Landekar is asking just um, if, 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 why is this unlisted? Is the stream going to be kept? Actually, this will be live. This will be public uh, later on. Uh, we're just putting it uh, there right now so we can um, figure out a bit more what to do with it later. But definitely, this is only for people who fo follow the, uh, the link right now. So... Yeah, Evan, please go. And you'll, you'll be able to watch a replay on this same page afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, is there any other question we have before we wrap up this uh, stream here? Um, yeah, I think we just we'll have one more here. Um, uh, let's see. I, I, I didn't get who asked this, but if you find that your painting has gone off the rails, what is the first thing you look for to backtrack and bring everything under control? Or how, how do you find out where it went wrong? <laughs> well, I think today you're asking the wrong guy because like in my painting <laughs> earlier, it went off the rails and I just went with it. You know, it's like if, <laughs> when you're driving on a car and you're going like on Northern California or like in, in parts of Europe, like this, there's roads that are so high up. It doesn't matter if you're wearing a seatbelt. You're going off. Just go with it, you know? So <laughs> sometimes embrace that, you know, because it, it's going to lead you to different places that you didn't, it, you know, you didn't I agree uh, so much with that. I agree so much with that. It's and, like, and, yeah, you just continue with it and, yeah, please. Nurture it. Nurture it. Yeah. Just continually ask yourself, okay, I, I, I went off the plan, but now what is it about and what's the best way to say it? And do I need this component or this component to help that? Or how can I create a path of movement like like this slide here this is all about the movement for this little you know doc scene i did here i'm constantly thinking how the lines interact and flow with each other like and you know whether i add extra boats back here take the motorcycle away can i still get right. that sense of movement you know with it you know as a result yeah um and so that that you know it's just like okay yeah it it's a give and take sort of thing sometimes you got to add something sometimes you got to remove it but always like yeah when you make changes that may potentially bring in new problems that you just you have to treat them as a problem that you need to resolve mm. and just identifying them is the contrast off is the color too bright you know that's yep. just that's what the fundamental training comes in because you, your eye will be trained to pick up and, and, and it's honestly harder for your own work it's harder for my own work i got i get second opinions all the time because like you get invested with these mm -hmm. ideas and it's much easier to see the, the flaws and where things are going when you didn't look at it for an hour or two straight. So yeah. put it That's away, flip true. it, look at it, look at it the next day, get a second opinion. If you're, if you doubt, at, you know, a certain specific, specific part of it. Mm. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for all of this awesome insights into your composition, into your process and everything. Thank you for having me on. This has been a blast. So Absolutely, we'll man. Again, definitely, so. definitely. Thank you, Evan, as well. So sure thing. Cool, Tyler. Yeah, I do, yep. I do break. I do have a free additional tutorial on this stuff just for sub, sub uh, subscribing to my newsletter on at the brushsauceacademy.com. You get the one that's on screen where I really dissect the composition and show the process of this uh, Zelda inspired waterfall scene. And you can see all the math and the, the geometry that it, it gets. It can get busy and, and technical, but I do for those of you that want a little bit more of an in-depth breakdown. Perfect. Yeah. Where, where can they follow you? Otherwise, other than Art Station, YouTube, Tyler Edlin on there. Instagram. I'm on Instagram. It just I never made like funny online names or anything like that. Like if you just <laughs> Google, I try to make myself as findable on the internet as possible. Stock the heck out of me. Just Google my name. I'm on. I'm on every major platform. Awesome. Well, guys, definitely follow him. There's he has a lot of tutorials everywhere. Really useful ones on Art Station, on YouTube, on Instagram, and he has a bunch of Gumroad things as well so yeah and also so all right i'll, I'll just uh, say thank you to you guys and uh yeah do a bit of um um head out here so all right well um yeah definitely thank you guys for tuning in and um i hope you had a great time 
uh, that you picked up some awesome tips and tricks. And um, definitely don't forget to join the challenge that we have over at the um, Evident Design uh, group. And for those of you who really want to improve your art skills, uh, there'll be a three-day online workshop with Tyler Edlin on composition through Evident on 9th of April. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, you can join the Evident Design newsletter uh, to get notified further. And there'll be some limited spots as well for um, for for paint over, um, you know, for, for live paint overs and feedback. So definitely don't miss out on that event. So that's it for us. I uh, hope you had a great time. Stay creative, everyone. And um, yeah, catch you guys later. See you around.